Welcome back. Today we are going to talk about uh, chapter two, Introduction to Chemistry. As you navigate this lecture, there are nine objectives and questions that you should be able to answer at the end. In this lecture, we will talk about uh, basic chemistry as well as a little bit of biochemistry. We will talk about matter, energy, different types or forms of energy. We will address chemical elements and the ones that make up the bulk of the human body. We will discuss compounds and mixtures and different types of mixtures. We will touch on chemical reactions as well as the factors that affect chemical reaction rates. And we will finish up by talking about acids, bases, and the pH scale. We will only briefly talk about chemistry in this course only because uh, chemistry truly underlies all physiological processes in the human body. Chemistry makes up everything that the human body is, uh, from the tiniest little particles to the overall organ systems. We will see chemistry associated with movement in the muscular system. We will also see chemistry associated with the heart and how it pumps blood throughout the body. As we move throughout this lecture, we will talk about two types of chemistry. Basic chemistry, which will really consist of atoms, elements, matter, energy, and then we will finish by talking about biochemistry, which is the biology of all living material. The first part of chemistry that we are going to talk about is matter. You may already be familiar with this, but to keep things simple, we will call matter the stuff of the universe. It is really anything that occupies space and has mass. Matter can be seen, felt, or smelled, and we see it exist in the universe in three different forms. Now, we'll talk about each of these forms and relate it back to the human body. Matter can first exist as a solid. We will see this when we look at teeth and bones. Matter can exist as a liquid, such as cerebrospinal fluid, when it surrounds the brain and spinal cord, as well as blood. And we will also see matter in gas form in the air that we breathe, oxygen and carbon dioxide. The next topic of basic chemistry that we will touch on is energy. And when you compare it to matter, energy is really less tangible. Um, but in short, energy is the capacity to do work or to put matter in motion. The greater the work done, the more energy was used to produce that work. Um, and again, we measure energy by its effect on matter. So for example, if you take a baseball player, that baseball player hits a ball out of the fence or over the fence, like in a home run, but also hits a ground ball. We know that the baseball player exerted more energy when he or she hit the baseball over the fence compared to the ground ball. We will see energy in two different forms, the first being kinetic and the second is potential. Kinetic energy is energy in action. Uh, we see evidence of this in the constant movement of small particles of matter, also known as atoms. But we can also see it in larger objects such as a bouncing ball or a swinging door or even the heart beating and forcing blood throughout the body. The other form of energy is known as potential energy, and this is stored or inactive energy that is capable of doing work. For example, batteries. You buy batteries at the store, they're not doing you much good yet, you go home and you put them in a remote control and they work. Um, so that is an example of potential energy transforming to kinetic energy. In addition to kinetic and potential energy, we can also identify four different forms of energy. 
from these different forms, if you were to see them on your exam, you should be able to take an example and understand what form it is. Uh, we have chemical, electrical, mechanical, and radiant or electromagnetic energy. So on your exam, I could give you a scenario or I could simply ask you what form of energy results from the movement of charged particles. Or I could take any of those four definitions and ask you to define it. Chemical energy we see stored in the bonds of chemical substances. Uh, the best example is food. Um, you consume breakfast, lunch, dinner. That food stuff is passed through your digestive system and further broken down to pull out energy or ATP from those substances. Electrical energy uh, results from the movement of charged particles. We will see electrical energy in the cardiovascular system, in the heart. And you may also see electrical energy in EXS217 when you study the nervous system. Mechanical energy is directly involved in moving matter, whether that's swinging the baseball, swinging the golf club, moving the pedals on a bicycle. And lastly, we have radiant or electromagnetic energy. It travels in waves. You see this in the microwave in your kitchen. We see it in heat waves. Um, x-ray machines, just to name a few examples. For the next little bit, we will be spending some time talking about atoms and elements and how we put them together or take them apart. But overall, all matter is made up of elements. Um, for example, bone and teeth are made up of a lot of calcium. All of these elements can be found on the periodic table, um, but there are four that you absolutely need to know. And again, this could be a question on your exam. I could ask you to identify the four different elements that make up the majority of the human body. And they are listed on your screen. They are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. All of those elements, the four on the screen, plus the rest of the elements on the periodic table, are all made up of elements, or are all made up of atoms. These atoms are identical building blocks that come together to create an element. You could think of this as cells that are similar in function or structure coming together to create a tissue. But these atoms or these cells are what gives the element or the tissue its particular physical and chemical properties. So all of the atoms that make up oxygen are different compared to all of the atoms that make up hydrogen or nitrogen. Now I mentioned that we would talk about what happens when we bring together atoms or bring together elements and that is when we form molecules and compounds. Now, atoms don't usually exist on their own, but they come together to form larger molecules or larger compounds. A molecule is just a general term when we have two or more atoms bonded together, and a molecule can even be a single element, such as oxygen or O2. That means that there are two atoms bonding together to create oxygen or a single element, or we could even say a molecule of oxygen. Now when we have a compound, that is a special type of molecule that has two or more different kinds of atoms coming together. The examples that I have listed are glucose or sugar, which is C6H12O6, and water, which we all know is H2O. And again, those are different atoms coming together to form a compound. And we see that with glucose. We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We can also talk about combining matter when we address mixtures. And most matter in the universe, especially in the human body, is going to exist as one of the three basic types of mixtures. And a mixture will include two or more components that are physically intermixed. 
Uh, we will define each type as well as provide examples. Uh, it is extremely important that you are able to identify at least one or two examples of each of the following types. Examples of mixtures, or sorry, the three basic types include solutions, colloids, and suspensions. This diagram is pulled directly from the textbook, but in the left column we have a solution. The best example is mineral water or bottled water. Again, it contains two or more different types of components, but you cannot see the difference because the solute particles are so tiny that they don't scatter light and they definitely don't settle to the bottom. And in the next slide, we will talk about what a solute is and what a solvent is. In the middle column, we see a colloid. A, an example would be jello that you would make from a grocery store or that you would purchase. Our solute particles are getting a little bit bigger, uh, but they are not large enough to settle to the bottom, but we do see them scatter light. And lastly, and the right side of the diagram, we have a suspension. The greatest example of this is going to be blood. And that's because when you take a test tube of blood and stick it in a centrifuge that will spin it around rapidly, we see that red blood cells settle out. Those red blood cells are the solute particles. And because they're so large and dense, they settle to the bottom which leaves you with blood plasma. So when you simply have a test tube of blood, those red blood cells are suspended in the solvent, which gives blood that red appearance. The first type of mixture that we will talk about, define, provide examples, is known as a solution. A solution we had already said that a great example was bottled or mineral water. Another example is salt water. We consider solutions to be a homogeneous mixture, meaning that everything looks the same. You don't see the salt, you don't see the minerals, so we consider it homogeneous. And we will see that as we talk about colloids and as we talk about suspensions, those two types of mixtures are no longer homogeneous. But with any type of mixture that we talk about, we have two components, the solvent and the solute, or solutes. The solvent is present in the greatest amount, and this is usually a liquid. Um, this is the component of a mixture that is doing the dissolving. Um, a great example is water. The other component of a mixture, any type of mixture, is a solute or solutes. And that's the component that is being dissolved. You could think of this as the salt or the table salt or the minerals, uh, but it is usually present in smaller amounts. The next type of mixture that we will talk about is known as a colloid and as and the last type of mixture that we have is a suspension. Like a colloid, a suspension is also heterogeneous, meaning that you can tell the difference between the solvent and the solute particles. The solute particles are rather large and they do settle out um, or sink to the bottom. The example that I gave earlier was blood. Um, again, when it is left in a tube or when it is in a centrifuge and is forced to spin around at a rapid pace, those red blood cells settle to the bottom, leaving you with the solvent or the blood plasma at the top. Another example is a cup of sand and water. You go to the beach, you pick up a cup with some salt water, you include some sand, and after a while the sand is going to sink to the bottom. And you are then able to tell the difference between the solvent and the solute. Now you may be thinking, well, why isn't water a mixture? Because it's made up of several different types of elements or atoms. But there are several differences between mixtures being solutions, colloids, suspensions, compared to compounds. 
Now there is no chemical bonding in a mixture, so we have seen that all the examples that I have provided, all of the solute and the solvent, they are physically intermixed, meaning you can actually separate mixtures or separate their parts. We can separate sand from salt water. We can separate minerals from water. We could separate blood cells from blood plasma. Um, and we can do all of those things by straining, filtering, or even evaporating. And the last difference between mixtures and compounds is that mixtures can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. You can see the solute and the solvent, or everything appears to be the same, whereas compounds are only homogeneous. The next topic that we will cover with regards to basic chemistry is this idea of chemical reactions and equations. We will talk about three different types of chemical reactions or equations, uh, but we will see that these reactions occur when chemical bonds are formed, broken, or rearranged. And we will see that these reactions are written in a specific type of form called a chemical equation. Every chemical equation will always contain a reactant and a product. The reactant or reactants are going to enter into the reaction together and the end product is the product or the products if there are multiple. There are three types of chemical reactions. The first is known as a synthesis reaction. Um, and this is when we synthesize or we create something. So we take two or more reactants, put them through the reaction and get a larger product or a larger or more complex molecule. Synthesis is used in anabolic or building processes, such as building muscle. The example that I have provided is simply A plus B reacts to give you AB. On this slide, you will see a specific example of a synthesis reaction. And again, examples are great to know throughout this class. I will never simply just, well, I may simply ask you to define something. However, I would like to see that you can actually apply it to the human body in anatomy and physiology. But a good example of a synthesis reaction, you take amino acid molecules or building blocks, you react them or run them through a reaction, and you get a protein molecule. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So when you take many building blocks, you can eventually put them together to form a larger or more complex molecule. The second type of chemical reaction is known as a decomposition reaction or breaking down. Um, this is where we will break down a molecule or a larger, more complex molecule into smaller molecules. This is essentially the reverse of a synthesis reaction. And this is when we break bonds or involves a catabolic reaction. The example that I have provided is AB will react or when we break that bond, we will have A plus B. An example of a decomposition reaction would be taking a glycogen molecule and breaking it apart to get glucose. We will see this in muscle as well as in the liver. Glycogen is the stored form of glucose, which is sugar, and we like sugar as a primary energy substrate. We use glucose to form ATP or to create energy. So if we begin to exercise or lift weights, our body will take glycogen, the stored form of sugar, and break it down into smaller molecules that we can use to create energy. The last type of chemical reaction is known as an exchange or a displacement reaction. This type of reaction will involve both synthesis as well as decomposition. 
So in this type of reaction, we are going to make as well as break bonds. The first example that I gave was AB plus C will react to give you AC plus B. So we have broken the bond between AB and we have also formed a bond between A and C. The second example that I gave was AB plus CD will give you AD plus CB. So there we saw some sort of exchange between those two reactants in the final two products. The example that I have provided for an exchange or a displacement reaction involves ATP or energy reacting with glucose. Um, and at the end, we see that it's going to transfer a phosphate to the glucose, ultimately forming glucose phosphate. This is an extremely important reaction in the human body whenever glucose enters a cell or whenever sugar enters a cell. And that cell effectively traps the fuel molecule or the glucose inside of it for energy. So here we see ATP and glucose, and then that ATP will donate a phosphate to glucose. So we have some displacement and rearrangement there in that reaction. When studying chemical reactions, there are several factors that can affect the rate at which these reactions occur. The first being temperature. A higher temperature will increase the kinetic energy of the particles and the force of their collision. Therefore, increasing the rate of the chemical reaction. So increase temperature, increase rate. The second factor is concentration of reactants. The higher the concentration, the faster the rate of reaction. That's because the more reactants that are available, the more, the higher the probability of collision between those reactants, forcing the reaction. Third, we have the particle size. The smaller the particles, the faster the chemical reaction. Smaller particles are able to move faster and you don't have to break them down as much before they react. And lastly, a catalyst. So a catalyst is going to increase the rate of chemical reactions without themselves actually changing or becoming a part of the product. You go to boil a pot of noodles or boil a pot of water and you add salt. Salt is an example of a catalyst. Salt in the presence of hot water increases the rate at which we would see it begin to boil. The next half of this lecture will be spent discussing biochemistry, uh, which is the study of the chemical composition and reactions of all living matter. All chemicals when talking about biochemistry can either be organic or inorganic. We will spend the rest of this lecture talking about inorganic compounds. Um, for example, we'll talk a lot about water. We will address salts, also known as electrolytes, as well as acids and bases. Organic compounds will not be covered in this lecture, but they include your macronutrients, which are carbohydrates, fats, proteins, as well as nucleic acids. Water is truly the most abundant inorganic compound. Uh, it makes up the majority of the volume of living cells throughout the body. Um, and we will see that it is truly vital to life because of its properties. And we will address each of these properties on the following slides. We will talk about its high heat capacity, um, high heat of vaporization, polar solvent properties, reactivity, as well as cushioning. Water, uh, to start, has a high heat capacity. It has this ability to absorb and release large amounts of heat before changing, really, um, in temperature itself. And this is extremely important because it will prevent sudden changes in temperature in the body. 
Um, that can be due to external factors like sun or wind exposure or even by internal factors such as um, something that causes heat to release rapidly like muscle contraction. And it also ensures homeostasis by redistributing heat throughout the body as a part of blood. Another property of water is the high heat of vaporization. So it takes a while for water or heat to go from a liquid to a gas. And when it transitions to a gas, it's water vapor. You could think of this as sweat. As we begin to increase body temperature, either we're outside at the beach or we are exercising, our bodies will dissipate heat in the form of sweat, which is mostly water. So water is a useful cooling mechanism in the human body. Next, we like water in the human body and it's vital for life because of its polar solvent properties. We often refer to water as the universal solvent in the human body. And that's because for all of these chemical reactions to occur, they have to be wet or they have to depend on water, um, which is why we like water as the body's major transport medium. The majority of blood um, is primarily water, so that's where we find nutrients moving throughout the body, respiratory gases, wastes, amongst other substances. Another reason or reasons why water is so vital to life is first, it's reactivity. Water is an important reactant in many chemical reactions, especially in the human body. A great example is you eat breakfast, you eat lunch, and as your body takes that food stuff and passes it through the digestive system, what it's actually doing is breaking it down into its building blocks by adding a water molecule to each bond as it is broken. Another important factor of water is its cushioning. Uh, water is not compressible, but it does flow. It does move around certain solid structures. Um, and this is great for protecting certain organs. The best example is the fluid that is surrounding the nervous system or the brain and spinal cord. The majority of that fluid, known as cerebrospinal fluid, is made up of water. As we continue to move throughout this biochemistry portion of this lecture, uh, we will also talk about salts. In general, salts throughout the body are ionic compounds that will dissociate or will separate into their um, corresponding ions in water. For example, um, sodium sulfate is Na2SO4. When sodium sulfate is placed in water, it will dissociate into two sodium ions as well as one sulfate ion. All salts are going to be considered electrolytes because they conduct electrical currents when in solution, whether that's water in the body, uh, interstitial fluid or cerebrospinal fluid. All the ions that we will talk about like sodium, potassium, as well as calcium and iron play a special role in body functions. And we will see those on the next page. Inorganic salts such as potassium, calcium, sodium, are needed for many different things throughout the body, um, essentially to maintain homeostasis. Uh, but we have here proper osmotic conditions, so this is the flow of water or movement of water. Um, we need salts to maintain our acid-base balance or the pH scale. Um, we need potassium especially for the clotting of blood. We need calcium for the hardness and development of our bones and teeth. We need iron for the formation of hemoglobin. We will see hemoglobin when we talk about the cardiovascular system and blood. 
And lastly, we need sodium and potassium for the function of muscle as well as nervous tissue. For the remainder of this lecture, we will talk about acids, bases, the pH scale, as well as buffer systems. But for now, acids and bases are both electrolytes, meaning that they conduct electrical current when placed in solution, but also because they will ionize and dissociate or break into their separate constituents when placed in water. Acids, when placed in solution, are going to release hydrogen ions. For example, you place HCl or hydrochloric acid in solution, HCl will dissociate into its constituents, being hydrogen as well as chloride. When a base is placed in a solution now, it's going to release a hydroxyl ion, or an OH-. An example of this would be a bicarbonate ion. Uh, when you place bicarbonate in water, it is also going to dissociate and produce an OH and leave you with carbon. Bases are also known for picking up hydrogen ions from acids in solution. When talking about acids and bases, we have to address the pH scale, uh, which assesses the acid-base concentration. pH stands for concentration of hydrogen ions, and we can measure the pH of a solution. The more hydrogen ions that are being released in a solution means there is more acid present. Looking at the pH scale, it ranges from 0 to 14. 0 is the most acidic level, with 7 being neutral and 14 being very basic or very alkaline. Looking at the scale on your screen, you can see several examples on the right-hand side of different items or solutions and where they would fall on the pH scale. Again, if something is very acidic, meaning it releases many hydrogen ions, it's going to fall less than seven or towards zero. Hydrochloric acid measures at a pH of zero, whereas something that is very basic or alkaline like sodium hydroxide or household ammonia would fall above 7 or towards 14, measuring very alkaline or basic. We will finish up this PowerPoint slide um, or presentation by talking about a buffer or a buffer system. There are several organs and structures in the human body that are capable of acting as an acid or as a base depending on the pH level of the surrounding environment. Certain examples um, of these organs and structures will be kidneys, the lungs, amongst other chemical systems. And again, these organs can release hydrogen ions if the pH becomes too alkaline. But these organs can also act as a base by picking up those hydrogen ions that are floating around if things become too acidic.